Al Jazeera Podcasts. Today, more than 100 million fingers are expected to take a dip in purple ink in Indonesia's general election. One of the biggest days in global democracy. But the person who might have the most sway is Indonesia's current president, who isn't even on the ballot. So how much change can Indonesians expect? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. Al Jazeera's Asia correspondent, Jessica Washington, found herself in an unlikely situation earlier this month. My cameraman was next to me, and it really felt like being in a mosh pit. There was dancing and cheering. She was at Gavaka Stadium in Jakarta. There were many popular rock bands. We were getting pushed around because people were quite excited to see him. That him wasn't a rock star or a K-pop idol, but a presidential candidate for this year's election. I've reported on elections elsewhere, of course, and I've not really seen uh, the kind of atmosphere that the candidates are able to achieve here in other elections. Jessica's been based in Indonesia for four years now, reporting on the country's thousands of islands and three different time zones. And her coverage around this election might not be what you'd usually picture when you think of election stories. Indonesia's vote is often hailed as a festival of democracy. There is this sense of excitement for people to be, you know, up close and personal with with the men who could lead this country uh, for the years to come. So I've been traveling around the country, going to various campaign events uh, for the presidential candidates. There has certainly been a sense that this is a very dynamic, energetic campaign because there are three candidates running for president. And I I certainly do see why they like to call it a a festival of democracy because there is this uh, rather spirited quality. You know, voting here is, is not compulsory, but Indonesians are very quite enthusiastic about their democracy, and we do see that turnout is is generally quite high. And now all the, the posters and banners have been taken down, but they've been up for the past few months, and you get quite used to them being there, seeing all these politicians' faces lining the streets. One of those faces is Prabowo Subianto. He's considered the front runner of the election. But this isn't his first time in the race. Prabowo has run for president twice before and lost. He's run for vice president once and lost. So at the last elections, 2014 and 2019, of course, President Joko Widodo won. It's official. Indonesian President Joko Widodo has been re-elected to serve a second term. And he's declared victory after the election commission announced official results. And the person that he was up against was Prabowo Subianto. Joko Widodo also known as Jokowi, is the outgoing president. He's been in office since 2014, but can't run again thanks to a two-term limit. And he has a long history of political rivalry with Prabowo Subianto. The election campaigns during those years were certainly not particularly friendly. There was definitely at least some perceived animosity between these two men. So I don't think that anyone could have expected that in 2024... Prabowo Subianto would be running for president with Jokowi's son standing beside him as his vice presidential pick. Gibran Rakabuming Raka is now Prabowo Subianto's running mate. Prabowo's vice presidential candidate is Jokowi's eldest son. Gibran, Jokowi's son, is quite new to the political scene. Prompting criticism among people who see the pairing as an attempt to create a political dynasty rekindling Indonesia's past. He's the mayor of Solo, and that's also how Jokowi started his political career a long time ago. And I think there is a sense that when people see Gibran, even though they don't know him very well, that they see Jokowi. It's sort of a rather interesting political maneuvering that I think definitely caught people by surprise. And if you went back and asked someone 10 years ago, do you ever think that Jokowi and Prabowo could find some sort of mutual interest, I think that would surprise a lot of people. 
But Jessica says Prabowo's political reasoning for that alliance is clear. The important context is that President Jokowi is a very popular man. I think many world leaders would be quite envious of his high approval ratings and how well-liked he is by the Indonesian public. And so some analysts call it the Jokowi effect, that being in close proximity to Jokowi is politically advantageous. And I think we've seen that for Prabowo Subianto. People now associate him with President Jokowi, even though, you know, they ran against each other in the last two elections. Prabowo is currently the defense minister. He's had a long military career, most of which was under former President Suharto, who ran Indonesia for three decades. Prabowo was dishonorably discharged over his alleged role in the kidnapping of student activists. There's the Prabowo of the 90s, who is, of course, associated with these allegations of human rights violations during his time in the military, allegations of being involved in the kidnapping of activists. The former Special Forces commander is accused of being behind the kidnappings of human rights activists who criticized Soharto in 1998. Prabowo has not been prosecuted over any of these issues, and I would say that these issues are not of huge significance to the majority of voters, perhaps for two reasons that there's such a large base of young voters born after these events. Um, but then also that, you know, there are just different concerns at the grassroots levels and, and, and different ways of perceiving and understanding whatever may have happened. The human rights allegations don't seem to affect Prabowo Subianto's popularity because to many people it's considered a thing of the past. Jessica says he's had a process of transformation one she's witnessed after speaking with him over the course of her reporting. Meeting him the other day, it was after the final campaign event, and it was quite apparent that he was in very good spirits and and feeling very confident that he will be the next president of Indonesia. My policy is a very rational, logical, common-sense approach that is actually building up on all the work of our predecessors. But there are also two other candidates running and hoping for a different result. So both of them are former governors. Anis Baswedin is a former academic. He served as also an education minister during Jokowi's first term as president. Um, And then later he became the governor of Jakarta. He's put forward a campaign that is is quite intellectual and also that is quite unique in how it engages with people and it it invites members of the public to to come up on stage and debate with him and, and ask him questions. And I think that's, you know, done quite well for him and he's, you know, faring reasonably well in in the polls. Ganjar Prano is uh, from the same party that backed Jokowi's presidential bids and he is a former governor of Central Java. He's pitched this campaign of being able to understand the issues that ordinary people face because he himself has come from a, a humble background. And while those three candidates are the ones running in this year's presidential election, there's another man's name on many people's minds. If someone was to ask me what the main issue of of this election is, in a sentence, I would say it's the the legacy of of Joko Widodo, of of Jokowi. All the candidates are framing themselves in relation to him. Anis has had quite a clear campaign message of certainly not opposing everything Jokowi-related, but some of the key ideas, for example, building the new capital. Metro Jakarta has a population of around 30 million people, but this megacity has a massive problem. It's sinking. The government is abandoning the capital and moving it a thousand kilometers away, building a new city on the island of Borneo. It's a multi-billion dollar project on the island of Borneo, relocating from from Jakarta, where I am. He sort of called into question, put forward a a need to reassess the necessity of that and what money that's used for that could be used for instead. The Jokowi effect is a little more complicated for the other two candidates. 
So Ganjar perhaps would have been seen as the natural successor to Jokowi. Um, they have reasonably similar backgrounds and, of course, both being supported by the same party. And therefore, I think he's he's struggled a bit with his, his campaign message when it's quite clear that Jokowi is not supporting him, but he also can't call into question too many of Jokowi's policies because they're being backed by the same party. And meanwhile, of course, Prabowo has pitched himself as the, the continuity candidate, the person who will continue Jokowi's legacy, who will see out Jokowi's goals. So everyone's sort of pitching themselves in in relation to Jokowi, which is interesting because obviously he is not someone that people can vote for in this election. After the break, what's at stake for Indonesians in this vote? During Joko Widodo's time as president, there have been major improvements to many Indonesians' quality of life. Unemployment rates have dropped, and a new high-speed rail is now operating between Jakarta and Bandung, two of the country's largest cities. But Jessica's been reporting on Indonesians who haven't seen some of that progress. Voters living in poverty in both urban and remote rural areas make up a significant demographic. In addition, about 30% of the population is considered economically insecure, meaning they would struggle to make ends meet if they fell ill or were affected by a natural disaster. So we we did travel to Flores to meet with some voters there, voters living in poverty, and, and spoke to them about what they would like from this election. And their concerns are, are very much about the basics. Our hope is that after the election, please consider us ordinary people because we still need basic things like water, roads, electricity. It is certainly that poverty alleviation has been a, a key focus of this election. For the candidates, another key focus has been targeting a specific demographic. Voters under 40 make up more than 50% of the voting population. There's a large proportion of of first-time voters, and many of them have concerns about education, about employment. Some of them also have concerns about the the state of democracy and are wary about a, a process of democratic backsliding in Indonesia. And the discourse that we've seen from many youth groups is, well, you know, while we may not find ourselves represented at the highest levels of politics, this can be an opportunity for young people to to have some say in the future of, of the country. Jessica went to a meeting hosted by one of those groups. The event that I covered uh, was an event organized by a group called Bijak Mamili. They'll translate it as choose wisely or, or wise choice. And basically they are not aligned with any of the candidates. They have basically created this platform for young voters or or any voter really uh, to have a look at, well, what are they promising the candidates? And then they also organized this democracy festival in Jakarta and thousands of young people came. And we walked in and it, it felt like it was a film festival. People were quite excited to be there and you see a photo booth and then it's already got in the frame each of the the presidential candidates. And that might sound, you know, silly, but actually it's quite a clever way to get people familiar with, well, who are these people? What do they look like? There was also, when you walk in, a booth where you could practice voting for the first time. And, you know, some of the first time voters told us, well, I've never done this before, so I just want to make sure that I I do it right. But at the same time, we have seen sort of gimmicky social media uh, efforts to appeal to this group of of young voters. Prabowo Subianto and Gibran have these cute cartoon avatars. They look like Pixar characters in almost all their campaign banners. And that sort of softens the image of Prabowo. 
to make him seem quite approachable and and even fun, um, like a fun uncle rather than a, you know, a former military man. The 72-year-old's dance steps on the campaign trail have helped endear the former army general to many of Indonesia's young voters. Presenting himself as a chubby uh, old grandpa and uh, this attract uh, many supports from uh, Indonesian people. Korean pop is hugely popular here, so, you know, that's been acknowledged by by the candidates. Uh, Anis has been, you know, making appearances on on TikTok, and uh, some of his supporters have given him, like, a K-pop nickname. And Ganjar uh, Prano has been um, hosting dialogues with, with young people, meeting them where they already hang out, some of the trendy spots in in Jakarta and also appearing on on cooking shows, comedy shows, TikToks. So we have seen them making these efforts. You know, these these older gentlemen, you know, Anis and Ganjara in their 50s, Prabhu is in his 70s, but making these efforts to appeal to young people. And again, this youth vote represents half of Indonesia's voting population they could be decisive, regardless of whether the election goes to a runoff or is won in one round. But no matter who is inaugurated in October, Jessica says there are still questions over how much will change. I think what we can say with confidence is that all of these politicians have learned that the Jokowi formula leads to some degree of success. I think this election has also been quite a revelation in the sense that the politicians who appear to be political rivals, suddenly, years later, these ideas converge when it's a matter of political convenience. There's a bit more shrewdness about the way politics works in this country. But it's hard to say, like, does it actually affect the lives of of ordinary people? And some people say that it, it might do, because, you know, if people like Jokowi so much, that is probably to do with people feeling that their lives are getting better, that they've seen the infrastructure, they've seen the development that's come with the Jokowi years. His presidency is certainly characterized by this extreme developmentalism, focusing on these major infrastructure projects around the country. So perhaps the way Indonesia changes is that the Jokowi effect continues even after he's out of office. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Chloe K. Lee and Farinisa Campana. With Zaina Bezer, Sonia Bagad, David Enders, Sariyad Khalili, Miranda Lynn, Ashish Malhotra, Nagin Oliayi, Khalid Sultan, Amy Walters, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Joe Plord mixed this episode. Alexandra Locke is the Take's executive producer, and Nate Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back. <laughs> 